I'm from North Branch Nature Center down in Montpelier, and we coordinate a statewide amphibian road crossing program to get folks out there and involved with saving amphibians as they cross the road in the spring. Uh, and we'll talk more about that later, but if you'll entertain me first, these are our amphibians, our frogs, our toads, and our salamanders. And if you'll allow, I am gonna dive briefly into the etymology of amphibian. It's a word that comes from two Greek words, amphi meaning both and bios meaning lives. Because while we might be most familiar with these amphibians in their adult stage, like this spotted salamander here that is a veritable dragon, a ferocious apex predator under the leaf litter in the forests around us. Uh, they're actually, um, they spend a lot of their lives in puddles, in pools and ponds, fully aquatic, breathing um, through gills or through their skin entirely underwater. And they, while this, uh, terrestrial version of the salamander, the adult phase, uh, is a terror to all sorts of slugs and worms and insects that crawl under the leaves in the forest. The larval salamander, the aquatic stage, is a top predator for all sorts of things like fairy shrimp, copepods, amphipods, and the aquatic larvae of many, many different kinds of flying insects. So they've really worked out this way where at two different parts of their life history, at two different stages, they're the peak predator. They're a big fish, big figurative fish in a pond, in a little pond. Uh, but because they need different habitat for their adult phase and their um, larval phase, their, their younger phase, uh, it really requires two sorts of conservation for those different sides of uh, their lives and really good connectivity between them. And that is a bit where our project um, tries to make a solution. Tonight, first, we're gonna focus on the ecology of these critters in three phases, how they live, how they migrate on spring nights coming up soon, and then what their breeding looks like in these ponds that they're mi migrating to. And we don't have time to go through every um, amphibian in the state, so we're gonna introduce you to three characters tonight. But first, let's think about where these amphibians are right now. And in this diagram, it conveniently uh, depicts some of that small dusting of snow that we got today and the last day. And then below the snow, there's the leaf litter and soil and, and ground that until mud season is frozen quite solid. And our frogs, our spring peeper here with an X on their back and a wood frog go below the soil in really shallow places where they'll hibernate. Well, well they're overwinter by pumping their blood full of natural um, antifreeze to protect their cells from freezing. And then they'll freeze solid like little, little froggy ice cubes. And then they'll thaw out in the spring uh, when the temperature warms up under the soil. Meanwhile, the salamanders have a different free hybrid uh, in your backyard garden. You'll know that you have to dig feet and feet, uh, two feet in some places to almost four feet in others. Um, to get below the frost line. And that's where all of our salamanders are overwintering. And I think that migration really hasn't happened except for maybe at some strange um, sites that are really well protected or have a lot of insulation, insolation that is Southern aspects where they get a lot of sun in your area. Uh, so this is probably where almost all our amphibians are right now. So first let's meet our first character, the spotted salamander. And this is a true, truly charismatic creature. Uh, we love to have it as a mascot of this program. It's on all the promotional materials because it is very conveniently colored, uh, dark black and gray with these yellow spots that bring road crossing straight to mind. They're truly a huge, huge amphibian. They're about the size of a Snickers bar. And I say that, I mean a king's 
size Snickers bar, something that if you got it in your, your Halloween candy, uh, that would be a house you'd return to every single year. Um, and while these are truly magnificent, large creatures, um, and quite common, they're, they're the most common rank in the state conservation ranking system, um, they're quite rarely seen except for during migration and breeding because they are a mole salamander. They're in that genus Ambistoma. All of our mole, mole salamanders are in that genus, meaning like moles, they're fossorial. They live underground. And when they do come above ground or above the leaf litter, they are nocturnal. So they just don't cross paths with humans all that much. And they're in hardwoods and mixed mixed forests, eating crickets, worms, spiders, beetles, really just about any uh, terrestrial invertebrate that can fit in their mouth as an adult. Our next character is the wood frog. Um, also extremely cute. This is about the size of a Reese's peanut butter cup. Um, the small ones, right when they're leaving the ponds uh, after they've grown their legs to become terrestrial trail amphibians. They're about the size of one of those small Reese's peanut butter cups that you might get thrown out at a 4th of July parade. But by the time they're an adult and by the time they're returning to ponds in the spring to breed, they're the size of like a full size, uh, king size Reese's peanut butter cup. And they're brown to beige, um, really blending in the woods. And then they have that raccoon or bandit mask that goes from their nose to behind their eye. And another them is that dorsolateral ridge. That's this right where my cursor is pointing, this small ridge that runs from behind their eye to right back where their leg connects uh, to their body. And like their, what their name suggests, wood frog, they live in forests and they also eat. And they're quite common. But uh, well, these are S5 common and Mole salamanders, these spotted salamanders are also S5 common. You're much more likely to see a wood frog um, because they do a lot of their hunting at night, but because they aren't fossorial, because they don't hide underneath ground or underneath the leaves, uh, you might come across them during the day. And they do when I'm in the woods and I, I see a wood frog, it's because motion that I that I walk somewhere I didn't see a wood frog and then I hear or see some motion and I it's the wood frog hopping over. toad salamander which we'd be lucky to see in your area there are some occurrences up here on the Canadian border um, but these are really fantastically beautiful salamanders and they're much smaller way way smaller than that um, spotted salamander we saw earlier. They're about the size of a Smarties, about that big. And they have a rusty back with these herringbone grooves down their sides and a really spectacular black and white spangled flank and belly. Uh, they live in forests, especially forested wetlands in the Champlain Valley. But there are, in this map, you can see some records further north and towards your region. They, they eat small arthropods. They're much smaller, but uh, we'll eat the, the same sort of things. Smaller bugs, smaller beetles. And they are one of the species of greatest conservation need uh, in the state because they have a really interesting life history and um, really limited habitat in the state. So we do come across these in our surveys every year, and we're really excited to report those and get that data to state conservationists. A great, another great um, way to identify these is that if you follow the tail, back behind the legs where the tail meets the body, there's a little notch. And that notch is really important to keep in mind because that is actually where the tail can detach. These salamanders can detach their tail at will and they'll do that as a predator avoidance strategy. If, for instance, a uh, hungry raccoon was to be pawing around and grab onto one of these salamanders, they might drop their tail off, which would then wriggle around and distract the raccoon, either surprising it um, from all the motion or distracting it and, like, and keying in on its predator instinct so that the, pr the predator, the raccoon, raccoon in this instance might go for the tail rather than the rest of the salamander. And the salamander could escape and live to uh, 
uh, get to a wetland another day. Uh, the salamanders do survive this, um, but it is a huge caloric uh, cost. They have to eat a lot of small bugs to regain the energy to regrow that tail. And really importantly, uh, in the time while they're regrowing that tail, they don't have that last ditch uh, measure that they can deploy to get, a, get away from a predator. So when we are helping these cross the road, we want to be really careful with how we handle them so that we don't bring our hands anywhere close to that tail that can detach, uh, because that'd be a bad night for everyone involved. Great, so let's go on to where this spotted salamander is living. Like I said, they're nocturnal and they spend a lot of their time underground in rodent burrows or root channels. They could be all throughout the forest floor. If you're out there specifically looking for them during the day, not during a uh, nocturnal road crossing, so checking under logs or rocks would be a great place to look uh, because they have to stay moist. These salamanders uh, breathe largely through their skin um, through the mucous membrane of their skin, and to do so, it must stay moist um, to, for them to get oxygen. That yellow, black and yellow spotting looks really stands out against a gravel road like this. In their natural habitat on a diversely colored uh, forest floor with all sorts of leaves and flowers, it actually breaks up their outline pretty well. And um, they're surprisingly hard to see even during the daytime. Uh, on top here. Great. Next, we have the wood frog, uh, which is also mostly nocturnal, but like I said, you could see more often during the day than other amphibians we'll talk about here, uh, just because they don't, uh, ne they don't necessarily go under the leaves or underground uh, during the day. So you might come across them if you're walking around off trail out there. Um, but for the most part, they blend in so well that you're unlikely to see them until they choose to move. And you can see that dorsolateral ridge I mentioned earlier, that good field mark that goes from the back of their eye all the way to their leg. It really mimics the midrib and the color of some of these fallen leaves. Coon mask or bandit mask on their eyes really mimics uh, shadow. So their outline's really broken up and they can really hide uh, on the forest floor. Next, we have our, our, our four-toed salamanders, um, which love forested wetlands. And I say it's acid tolerant. It's tolerant of naturally occurring acidic soils. So those are uh, soils that might support a lot of blueberries or, or pine trees or might have um, low drainage. Uh, that's not talking about anthropogenic pollution or acid rain um, leading to acidity. All amphibians, because they are covered in a mucous membrane and because they spend so much of their lives uh, directly in water, are really to pollution. So they're one of the, the stenecologists are looking at to first serve as a figurative canary in the coal mine um, in terms of um, environmental degradation. So when there's a toxic spill or some sort of pollution, you might have um, amphibians have really strange defects like growing extra limbs or becoming more asymmetrical. We actually have some evidence that um, the spots on these salamanders, on these spotted salamanders, when exposed to pollution, they become more and more asymmetrical. Um, and that's even more striking when at really high levels, things will start to grow extra limbs. Um, but returning to this figure, this, these different strategies that the, the frogs, where they flood their bodies with antifreeze and freeze solid above the frost line, and the salamanders go with freezing. Uh, it has some real impact on their migration and the timing of that. As the snow melts tomorrow, this afternoon, uh, the top layers of soil are much more responsive um, to change than deep, deep below. If you put in a root cellar or, or stored vegetables in a root cellar, you'll know that the ground can be supremely insulating. 
Uh, so those salamanders uh, far below ground are much less responsive to um, a few really hot days than these frogs right above. So it's always the frogs that start migrating um, before the salamanders. We've just now, we had those here in Montpelier, I think two weekends ago, we had some days in the 60s and I started to see um, data coming in from southern Vermont uh, in the lower elevations of the Champlain Valley of some people going out on those rainy nights and seeing some amphibians crossing the road. Um, and it was all wood frogs and spring peepers to start. But just now we're starting to get some reports of salamanders uh, in the Champlain Valley. And I'm really hoping that Thursday, I think you might be predicted to have snow. It might be rain down here. Thursday might be a really good night for us. Um, but yeah, you can expect frogs to start moving before salamanders. Some years um, it works out that the soil temperature, air temperature, melting snowpack, and first spring rains co-occur or like it happens slowly enough that those first rains, it has to be wet for migration to occur. Um, it can synchronize the salamander and frog migration, but oftentimes we'll start to see the, the beginning of frogs before the beginning of salamanders. And then toads actually come far after both of those. Um, yeah. And those first spring rains can be really important because that, that really helps as that warm liquid water infiltrates, goes through the soil, that can really bring warmth and act as a cue uh, to those deeply buried salamanders. Um, but it's kind of, it's hard, it can be kind of hard to predict what a good night will be for salamander and frog migration. Uh, but these, these are the things that we know are important. And uh, we just we just do the best that we can to go out there when we have the chance and um, and we think categories or we think that the forecast might uh, be conducive to migration and Vermont's a big state or this conservation project covers the whole state we can we can't really cover the whole region with a amphibian migration forecast uh, but later in the the talk i'll give you some a few keys that will really help you set you up for success for getting out there on uh, good nights when you can see a lot of these amphibians and help them uh, get across the road safely so talking about migration spotted salamanders their migration is really well studied and this 2009 study um, managed to track most of the spotted salamanders coming to this breeding pool and they found that uh, an average salamander may travel more than a quarter mile through dense woods, open fields, clear cuts, over roads. They'll go through any sort of habitat that they can cross uh, to get to those pools where they'll all meet to breed. And this, this is the average one may travel a quarter mile or more. Some of them may go about a quarter mile, get to the pond that they were born in, where most of the salamanders in that population will stay and continue to breed but they might look around and decide that that pond is not the one for them and then continue on and those rare salamanders that travel and travel and travel between pond and pool and puddle uh, can be really important for the large landscape scale conservation of the species because they're carrying their genes uh, far afield and they really contribute to the diversity and the long-term health of this population. So that does have the meaning that if you're helping amphibians cross the road and you see one pointing away from the pool, you do let help it cross in the direction that it's pointing. That might be one of those salamanders that's one of those rare events that's really important for the genetic diversity at the landscape scale. Um, but this 2003 study found that 90% of spotted salamanders that went to a vernal pool came in just five days. And these can be hundreds and hundreds of salamanders. Uh, so in good years, it can be really synchronous. All these salamanders, while they have mysterious cues, we're not exactly sure. We can't say like, oh, at 38.7 degrees Fahrenheit soil temperature, all the salamanders will move. We don't have that understanding yet 
Yeah. Uh, but the salamanders are, seem to be in sync and all get to the pool in just about the same couple days. And from an evolutionary standpoint, this makes a lot of sense. Um, if there are males in the pool uh, competing for females, you don't want to be the last male there. Um, and this is a little diagram of what I'd call almost perfect habitat, almost perfect habitat configuration for these amphibians. There's this upland forest, forested hills. There's some conifers in there and a lot of hardwoods right next to a wetland. And I say almost perfect because this pond, I think this is a beaver pond, um, or maybe it's a reservoir. This water body is a little too big for perfect frog and salamander habitat because it looks like it's never a pond that dries up and it looks big enough that it would host fish. And for these baby salamanders, while they might be a terrifying predator to a fairy shrimp or a, the tiny larva of a, of a dobson fly or dragonfly, they are fish food for any fish that could fit in its mouth. Uh, so any wetland like this that is large enough to support fish is marginal habitat for uh, salamanders. They will breed in it, um, but a lot of them might be eaten by fish. What truly is the rock star habitat for all these animals are vernal pools. And the definition of these uh, can vary based on your source, whether there's no inlet or outlet um, and how the water fills it up. But the really important part is that it dries out sometime during the summer or the fall. Um, so these are really small wetlands um, that eventually dry out. And that's really important because that's what means that they can't support predatory fish. And that really protects the baby amphibians and allows them to be that figurative big fish in a little pond as they eat all the swimming insects and all those uh, aquatic worms and all these things taking advantage of these forest puddles. And then by the time the puddle starts drying up at the end of the summer, the beginning of the fall, those amphibians have grown legs and adapted to life on land and they can crawl out of the puddle and begin their life in the forest floor. And uh, here we have, oh, actually uh, one comment on this, uh, this figure, this image here. This is from the Vermont Center for Eco Studies Vernal Pool Atlas project. And they also have a vernal pool monitoring project. And while our project focuses on protecting amphibians as they cross roads, that's just one phase of their life. That's just migration as adults to breeding. Um, for the full conservation, successful conservation of these species, we need protection at every phase of their life. So understanding where all these vernal pools are and these different colors, I forget exactly what they are, but these are all potential confirmed and or visited uh, vernal pools throughout the state. So through the Vernal Pool Atlas project or the Vernal Pool Monitoring project, you can check out to see if these are actually vernal pools. Uh, or if they are still vernal pools, if they haven't had a drainage ditch, un un uh, unfortunately, uh, cut through them. Um, and then the vernal pool monitoring project, you go back to known vernal pools um, and you can uh, monitor them for what sorts of amphibians are using them. Um, you can take water quality samples and all sorts of things. That can be really fantastic way to get to know vernal pools in your backyard. Uh, and get to know these amphibians at a different, really important part of their life. And thanks, Dean Pierce, for putting in the VP Atlas uh, link. Uh, the Vernal Pool Monitoring Project is also a VCE project. You can get them at vtecostudies.org. Uh, they're fantastic folks to work with. Uh, but this is what vernal pools look like in the wild. I think we're probably at somewhere between the second in third photo, probably close to the second photo now. Um, but we'll start to see amphibian migration right at that second photo. You'll often have um, 
spring peepers and particularly wood frogs hopping even over snow banks to get to these. But we generally uh, anticipate amphibian migration to start right at April 1st and right when almost all the snow is gone, everything but the largest snow banks. But we do have aberrant reports every once in a while of wood frogs in particular in vernal pools that are still largely covered by ice. And as the snow melts, these pools get bigger and bigger um, with the spring rain and the snow melt. And this is the phase in which the amphibians are really active, breeding and laying eggs. And then by the end of the summer, the pool has shrunk and shrunk and shrunk, uh, eliminating the, the viability of any fish eggs that might get through there. And hopefully the frogs and salamanders have grown their legs and crawled out and become terrestrial amphibians by that point. So to breeding, here we have the spotted salamanders where the males typically get to our vernal pools first uh, and they lay spermatophores. These are mucus pedestals, little plugs of mucus about that big uh, that you can actually see on the bottom of the, of the vernal pool. Um, and on top of that mucus pedestal, they'll put a tiny packet of sperm, which is also visible to the naked eye. You can see uh, many of the pedestals will have a packet of sperm on them. And then uh, those lucky pedestals uh, will be sperm packetless because uh, these male salamanders will do a little salamander dance showing how strong of a spotted salamander they are advertising their genetic material to a female spotted salamander, who then, if she takes interest, the male will guide to one of those spermatophores, one of those mucus plugs on the bottom of the floor of the vernal pool. And the female salamander will crawl over it and accept that sperm uh, that she'll use to fertilize over a hundred eggs uh, that she'll lay in the pond in big globs. And we actually have a video, yes, there it is, of one of these massive breeding events. Ooh, newt in it, and lots of spotted salamanders. Yes, there's a little, one of the, that salamander swimming, and that's similar to the, the mating dance that they do. They went a water ski. Nice. Um, but that's just a fantastic scene of what this migration, what the end of this migration to breeding habitat looks like. Let's see. And let's see if I can get the sound to work in this. This is another mass, and it has, uh, you'll also hear wood frogs which have a quack like call and then the peeping of spring peepers so the peepers are that sharp beep, beep, beep. and then in the back it sounds almost like a bunch of ducks at a duck feeder which are the wood frogs but these are the fantastic scenes of spring breeding and vernal pool life. Um, I think, but yeah, both those videos were shot um, during, at a site where the vernal pool or the, the breeding habitat was directly visible from the road. Uh, but if you want to be guaranteed salamander eggs, um, join the Ver vernal pool monitoring project of Vermont Center for Eco Studies. Next, we have the wood frog, which is one of the first frogs to call in spring. They have that duck-like call that was in the background of that last video. And they're truly explosive breeders. The male will hold on to the female, the back of the female, in a grip with his fingers called in plexus. And as she lays up to 700 eggs, he'll release sperm to fertilize those. And those eggs will form just a huge mat that can either float around the vernal pool or be anchored to the bottom or vegetation throughout it. The last, we have the four-toed salamander, which we've actually, which we've included here as kind of an oddity. It doesn't follow the same, its habitat is similar, but it doesn't follow the same um, uh, strategy for reproduction. 
it lays far fewer eggs. And while the wood frog and the spotted salamander have like the basal trait of amphibians and for that matter, egg laying animals, they have, uh, they have eggs that require water around them. Uh, it wasn't until the evolution of reptiles that we had membranes that could keep water in around an egg so that they could be laid on land. But the four-toed salamander has a bit of a workaround where frog eggs and uh, spotted salamander eggs are really attractive snacks for anything from a diving beetle to a leech to any sorts of things that are floating around in the vernal pool um, that are sphagnum moss. Um, and it goes deep into that, that wet sphagnum moss and just lays just a couple eggs, like four to maybe one or two dozen. And then curls around them. The female will curl around them for uh, the duration of them, of those eggs developing into larvae until they hatch. And then those tiny baby salamanders crawl out of the sphagnum moss and either plop directly into the pond. Hopefully the, the sphagnum moss was overhanging a pool or is right Right next to a pool, and those uh, water adapted larva salamanders will fall into the pool. That's really cool, terrific way for one of these small, uh, small amphibians to have a workaround to egg predation. So I showed this photo, this beautiful photo, as uh, ideal or nearly ideal habitat configuration breeding habitat configuration for these species. But all too often, this is more of the scene that we see where there are great woods next to a good wetland. But, but all too often there's, as Vermont has developed and we drive our cars around, a road has bisected these two habitats. And unfortunately, Oh, I have a caution sign here because the next slide will have some unbleeped uh, squished salamanders. So if that's not something you're interested in seeing, look away for about 45 seconds. Okay, with that warning in place, this is unfortunately what could be the case where um, salamanders and frogs, salamanders in particular, as they take a little while longer to cross the road, may be squished by car tires. Um, and this can be really impactful on the uh, longevity of these populations because just 10% of the population each year being hit, being uh, subject to road crossing mortality can extirpate, uh, lead to the local extinction of a population. While 100 eggs sounds like a lot to, from a human perspective, um, it's a really risky life out there, even without road crossings for a salamander. They're long lived and they don't lay thousands and thousands of eggs. Uh, like an insect would. Uh, so these road crossing fatalities can be really detrimental to their conservation across the state. And that is where you come in. That's where we come in. The Amphibian Road Crossing Program, uh, as sponsored by North Branch Nature Center and our local conservation partners like You Matter. Uh, and this program has four goals. The first is to increase public engagement in amphibian conservation. That's what we're all doing right now. Congratulations. We can all give ourselves a pat on the back for engaging in amphibian conservation tonight. And then on those, those rainy nights, we hope to decrease direct amphibian mortality at road crossing sites. Just getting people out on the roads, helping these amphibians across will have a positive impact on these amphibian species. And then from a more like structural standpoint, uh, we hope to inform transportation planning with robust data on movement and mortality at road crossings. With the data that our volunteers can provide and we compile, uh, things like local road commissions and state um, VTRANS uh, can invest dollars into road crossing structures to mitigate these wildlife vehicle collisions. And then fourth, we want to contribute state biodiversity data to conservation research. Um, 
the this migration only happens uh, for a short period in the spring, um, and it's a fantastic. And then we can take that data and let conservationists and state biologists know where the populations are doing well, where they're not doing well, um, and they can use that data for large scale planning. So this is what our on the ground impact might look like. Um, things like having a road closed, maybe just at night for a couple days uh, in the spring, or even just having a, a bigger culvert installed. Uh, culverts are being replaced time in particular, in particular surrounding large weather events like Sandy or Irene. And putting a big culvert in the right place can really impact, uh, positively impact wildlife. Uh, so we want to have that data in hand uh, to inform putting these in good places. And in Moncton, we've already had some great success where VTrans put in this fantastic wildlife crossing structure where amphibians coming from this wetland on this bottom left side to this woodland on the top right side would hit this cement barrier and either turn right and follow this all the way into this funnel and go under the road. Or even if they turn left, this actually has kind of a curly cue at the end that points them back around to follow this. So they eventually end up crossing under the road. And they've seen all sorts of animals using this. Deer, coyotes, foxes, bobcat. And then this is a fantastic um, time lapse of one night in this Moncton uh, in wildlife crossing structure, where you can kind of see little black dots. Those are all amphibians crossing through this on one. Uh, so the state often has funding for some of these projects, but, but the study of where to put them uh, can be prohibitively expensive and time consuming. Um, not a lot of agencies can flex to put out hundreds of people out on roads at night for these like funny couple days where the weather shifts to be just perfect in April uh, to get a good sense of where, where all these amphibians are crossing and where action needs to take to be uh, be taken. Uh, so we hope that our data can and already has influenced some of these. And sometimes it's so simple as we've had, I think three years ago now, there were some ARC, ARC volunteers, amphibian road crossing volunteers that went out to a site and they saw a construction drift fence, that, that silt fence that uh, construction folks put up to keep um, sediment from running off the construction site and getting into rivers. And they noticed that there were no salamanders, no frogs crossing the road. And they went to the construction site and they saw that they were all running into that, that fence uh, and then they couldn't cross. So they, that night, um, emailed some folks on the Conservation Commission and got in touch with the people at the construction site. And they just cut a couple little holes in that fence. And then all the salamanders and frogs could get through. Uh, so that was really direct, immediate impact that this volunteer program has. And so you, this is where you come in. And here we have some great amphibian holding techniques being demonstrated. This person has uh, the classic frog grip with the gentle hand below. And then very importantly, the hand above to keep the frog from hopping out of your hand. And here, oh my gosh, that's a beautiful white and black speckled belly of a four-toed salamander. And notice it's being very carefully hid, held far away from that detachable tail. Uh, so this is what your life can be like on some of those rainy nights in April. And now I'll tell you those couple keys that we have for good amphibian crossing nights. It needs to be dark. You won't have any luck around sunset. Wait till it, for it to be truly dark. It needs to be wet, actively raining, at least a sprinkle. It needs to be, most of the snowbanks need to be gone. I think there, there can be the largest snowbanks. Those at the end of your driveway can still be around, but the wood should be mostly snow-free at least. And it should be 
around 40, um, 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, these animals are cold blooded. Their metabolism drops way low at cold temperatures. Uh, so it's the warmer temperatures where they have uh, the energy and the capacity to do these long up to a quarter mile migrations to their breeding habitat. So that's it, dark, wet, snow gone, about 40 degrees. And we typically say starting in April. Um, but if we get some warm weather here soon, I think we might have a bit of an early season through some of the month. So to get started, you can go to our website, northbranchnaturecenter.org slash amphibian conservation, where we have a volunteer manual and resources. Um, and I certainly have forgotten to say some things today. And we only went through three of the species of the about 10 species uh, that we actively monitor. So check out that protocol for um, written details on how to do all of this. Uh, then after you do that, you can visit our crossing map. And here is a screenshot of our crossing map with three different colors. There's red, yellow, and green, where red are our highest priority sites because we don't have any data there yet. We don't know if there are amphibians moving there or not. A lot of these we put together through folks telling us that they think it might be a good site. And a lot of those end up being good sites. Or we went through and just on, on Google Maps or using satellite imagery, we found places that look like likely migration sites where there is a wetland on one side and forest on the other from the satellite view. But it takes getting people on the road to confirm that those are good amphibian crossing sites. And let's see. I can. Seeing a map now. Great. And you can zoom in up here. And you see a lot of red up here. We put in a lot of uh, places up in your area. Uh, um, and we're really excited to have volunteers go out and check these out. Let's go into this one. And as you zoom in, eventually at way high zooms, you'll see a pink line up here. Should see a pink line up here. Let me try another one. Oh, oh that's funny. Um, okay, I know these ones are good. As you zoom in, yeah, that pink line appears. And this is the transect. This is where we want you to walk. And really importantly, that transect has a start and an end. And zooming into it, you'll know that this is where all the amphibians are crossing. So when you're driving your car or riding your bike to the site, remember to park before you get to the transect because you don't want to drive over this place that we have identified as having a lot of amphibians crossing it and squish them with your own car. And then what you'll do is you'll park your car and you'll do a survey counting all the amphibians as you go all the way down. And when you reach the end, take that data sheet and file it away and get another data sheet out, a blank data sheet, and record a second data sheet for the way back. That way we know that your data is this given distance. And instead of having lap on after lap after lap on one data sheet, having a new data sheet for every lap, every there and every back. So that's a there data sheet and a back data sheet. That's two data sheets per pass from your car and then another one to your car. Um, that way we can compare apples to apples rather than apples to oranges as we share this data with conservationists in the state. Uh, so yeah, returning to there, we have this point and its priority and then understanding where the transect starts and ends. And this map is a really rich resource. If you click on the points, you can see uh, the name of the site, which is important when you record your data uh, and submit it through our data portal that I'll show you in just a minute. And then you can get a sense of who to contact, uh, 
if you have questions about the site maybe. Um, and then how many amphibians there might have been and really importantly traffic. If you're working with little kids, perhaps uh, it's best to go to a site that has really low traffic numbers, uh, which you might, which our map can help you tell or use common sites to avoid um, putting sites on anymore. Uh, but there have been some times when it looks like really great habitat and we put a site out. Do use your best judgment as to what would be a safe place for you to be out on the road. Uh, and we'll go over some more safety concerns um, in just a minute here. And then I'll, you can scroll through here and see what species they found at those sites. Great. And I'll go back to the presentation. And great. So now that you know where your site is, where to park and how far to walk, visit your site on those rainy nights during early spring where it's about 40 degrees or more and it's raining and it's dark. Uh, record data on the site condition that's uh, whether the road is wet or dry uh, and then the different category for rain anywhere from no rain to a total downpour. Uh, record the temperature if your car or a reliable thermometer says it um, and then count the number of cars during the survey and then really importantly um, how many salamanders you find, both live and dead. And um, it's a bit macabre, but it is important to remove those dead salamanders and frogs for a couple of reasons. One, we don't want to double count them. Um, being able to say how many dead salamanders and frogs there are can actually be one of the really important um, data points um, as that uh, transportation planners prioritize where to invest their resources with wildlife ha have wildlife crossing structures. Um, so we want to count the dead ones and we don't want to double count them. We don't want to count them on the way out and then count the same one on the way back. So we ask you to take them off the road. And also taking them off the road uh, is really beneficial to all those animals, those mammals, those raccoons, opossums, bobcats, even owls who might be attracted to those uh, the, that carrion as a food source. We don't want them to also risk uh, collision with a car. Um, and then we also ask you to photograph the rare ones, um, which are the four-toed salamander, blue-spotted salamander, Jefferson, or that Jefferson blue hybrid. And those that's depicted on the data sheet. Um, and there's some more notes in the volunteer protocol. Also, if there's an amphibian that you're unsure of the identity of, uh, just, just take a photo of that. You can submit that on our website um, and make a note of that on your data sheet when you submit it. And we can um, confirm, we can identify that for you and confirm what it is so that we pass off competent data to those people who are using this for conservation planning. Great. Uh, and <laughs> this is, we do have water sheet, waterproof data sheets available that I can either send to Sarah at UMatter uh, or if folks are passing through Montpelier, you can pick up at the Nature Center here um, because these surveys will take place during rainy nights. Uh, it's great to have a, a data sheet that can be written on when it's raining. This one is, if you can't tell, underwater in a sink in our office and it works just great. Awesome. And then the last step, uh, enter your data online in the entry form and upload any photos. Uh, those can be found on our website. Um, this is northbasenaturecenter.org slash amphibian conservation. You can join our email list, uh, report a new crossing, and then these are the really important ones. Uh, the online data entry portal, which will take you to a Google form to put in all of the information. And then a photo submission portal, portal if you had an amphibian that you're unsure of the identity of or was one of those rare ones. Great. And then congratulate yourself for helping amphibians at your site and across Vermont. Uh, the notes on safety. Uh, for amphibian safety, we ask that folks pick up amphibians with clean asterisk, wet Uh, just like the inside of our mouths or even our eyeballs. Uh, so any chemicals, any spicy oils um, or harsh cleaning chemicals can really impact these amphibians um, and hurt them. 
So wash your hands with a lot of soap and water with, with soap, but then really rinse your hands really well uh, and avoid using um, like eating flaming hot Cheetos or uh, using hand sanitizer while you're doing this work. You could also wear uh, rubber latex or nitrile gloves as a good way to ensure that the amphibians are kept safe and wet to keep that mucous membrane moist and low so that if the amphibian does escape your grasp, they don't have far to fall. Um, and I say handle only when necessary. If the amphibian's almost all the way across the road, uh, it can it can get, get there just fine. Um, I do think it is necessary to handle the amphibian if you've never picked one up before, or if you're with uh, a kid, they should definitely get their hands on them. Um, to keep yourself safe, bring a flashlight and extra batteries. Reflective safety vests and clothes are really fantastic. Uh, we have some at the Nature Center to lend out. Um, and that you can also check with local libraries. I know some have uh, that sort of equipment to support this work or uh, check with um, road commissions often have a lot of retired vests uh, to get out, to give out. And then crossing signs. There are some great crossing sign designs we've seen out there that say salamander crossing with great images of salamanders. But the really important thing about crossing signs is that uh, drivers are alerted that there are people on the road. So something like research in progress or like just people in the road ahead um, can be great. And then camera or smartphone to take uh, photos of these amphibians. A spatula that you never intend to use for food again is great for scooping those dead amphibians off the road. And then a clean bucket can be a great way to either hold on to an amphibian, hold on to a salamander so that you can spend some quality time with it, photographing it or just checking it out uh, without having to handle it a lot and stress it out that way. We might have a hundred uh, amphibians crossing on one data sheet. Having a bucket in those instances can be good to just scoop a bunch of them up from the road and then do like one movement to deposit them. And then of course, having a data sheet is a great thing. Uh, and having a protocol manual, maybe leaving that in your car to check on uh, if there's like an amphibian that you have a hard time identifying or a specific question about how the data is handled. Uh, otherwise, congratulate yourself for helping. Uh, briefly, last year we had 220 surveys done, 539 volunteer efforts with 331 hours out in the field. Uh, they counted over 5,000 amphibians, and this was actually actually a low year for us. Uh, it wasn't that last year there were fewer amphibians out there, it's just that uh, those start very often at like 2 or 3 a.m., which wasn't very conducive for many reasonable um, getting out there to count salamanders. So we're hoping that uh, this year we count a lot more amphibians and are graced with rain that starts sometime in the afternoon or evening. Uh, but other than that, um, uh, I'll, yeah, encourage you all to get out there and, uh, answer any questions if you have them. Thanks for your time tonight. Uh, feel free to unmute to ask a question or just throw it in the chat. Great, thanks. I'm just gonna assume that nobody has any questions. Um, okay. Unless someone types anything, but I just wanna thank everyone for coming and to um, look out in your email because we definitely wanna try to do one of these as you matter, um, especially since our area is so um, in need of these um, surveying, surveys. So um, please reach out if anyone has any questions or anything and thanks for coming. I got a vernal pool that dries up earlier each year. And I wonder what, uh, what is a safe date to hope it stays dry until? You know, I don't know. I think that'd be a great, uh, great thing to just get some eyeballs on the ground out there. Uh, Jeff, if you see um, 
Well, hopefully what you see is that the larval salamanders and larval frogs grow their legs and uh, transition to adult terrestrial life before it dries up. Uh, but yeah, it can be the case with changing climate regimes, changing snowpack, uh, that some of these vernal pools that have been a, a home run for, uh, in terms of um, habitat might no longer be. Uh, and that, that's a shame. Can they come back seasonally? Like after three or four years of drying too early, would it be likely with a good summer it would last? Yeah, yeah. There are certainly vernal pools out there that are good some years and not good other years. And so like this uh, spotted salamander we have here, in the wild, they can live over 20 years. So really like in terms for the, it's really risky breeding and uh, growing up as a, as a baby salamander in these vernal pools. It's really just rolling the dice that one of those years, uh, a couple of them survive to adulthood to then reproduce again. Um, yeah, so like playing, they, they play the long game and, and hope for good conditions in the vernal pool one of the years of their life. That's hopeful, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Great, well, uh, thanks y'all for your time. And uh, yeah, jo join our mailing list on our website and hope to see your data coming in this spring. Looking forward to those wet warm nights.